In the human world, autonomy means self-determination, being in control of your own capacity, being rational, being able to, to explain your um, interests and explain why you're doing things, and being able to act freely. And this is precisely what a machine cannot do. Um, induction processes are not uh, from the logical, from the formal logical point of view, uh, processes of rationality. They're, they are processes um, of probability. Um, so when it comes to a, an, a, an AI system, what you see is an automatization but not an autonomy, because it's not self-determined. It does not decide by itself what it wants to do. It does not have um, all this rational, procedural rationality that is required from a human being. Um, and it's unable to act within free parameters, because it's all programmed. The parameters within which in artificial intelligence is moving it, are already given by human beings, uncontrolled by human beings. So. Um, all the assumptions that we make with um, artificial intelligence are more an expression of our fears than uh, a reality of what inductive systems and statistics can do. One of the things that um, the, in this discussion is being mentioned a lot is the necessity to understand uh, the technicalities of artificial intelligence, of algorithms, and I don't agree with that. I think it's important to have an interdisciplinary team, and in some administration there are already interdisciplinary teams where you have a programmer or a developer, you have a social scientist that understands statistics, who understands statistics, uh, and you also have um, regulator, uh, jurists and economists and that is crucial to understand this type of technologies in specific sectors and I think that this is one of the first steps. I think that what we need to understand when talking about artificial intelligence it, this, that this is not a question only for engineers but that artificial intelligence specialized um, um, disciplines might also be in the legal departments, in the psychology departments, and many, many others. And according to that, um, and depending on this also public administration department that you're working with, uh, it will be necessary to consider also this type of disciplines. So if you're uh, if you're working at the agriculture department, you're going to need people that understand from the statistical point of view um, agriculture and climate change and uh, are able to work with numbers but you might also need anthropologists you might also need regulators and 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 this is partially already the case but there is sort of a slightly fear um, when it comes to um, use the knowledge of these people uh, into artificial intelligence programs because it is assumed that um, this is only a question for developers and I think that this fear needs to be erased because um, there's a lot that people can already contribute with uh, with their already existing uh, existing uh, sectoral knowledge. Well I think that you need to um, to, to get a, a very interdisciplinary team when you are designing uh, the algorithm. You need to assess what are the effects that you want to get and you also need to get to, to have a periodic assessment of the outputs that you are getting and one of the things that I think are crucial is also having monitoring algorithms uh, that look at um, the interaction between the public servants and the machines because all these systems are suggesting systems they are not fully automatized systems so there is a human in the loop at the very end deciding whether to trust the suggestion being made by the software or not to trust and you need some sort of systematic also to understand whether that interaction is going well or not and um, on and this is also the ambivalence of this type of technology because of course you might amplify discrimination by having a very um, a data set uh, and data banks that are the result of prejudices of uh, hundreds of years of prejudices in the criminal justice and prosecution or in the way how different parts of the city have been treated 
But what these technologies can also do on the other side is they are very good at identifying patterns. So they are very good at showing us more about human discrimination that might escape to human eye. So this is also a chance to understand how human beings are discriminating and how with assistance of algorithms uh, the public sector might be able to create better checks and balances to create an administrative process that is fair, that is consistent and that has its sort of self-reflective level through that use of technologies. I don't think that the way this regulation is being drafted and the conditions for that um, are precisely addressing that point. Moreover, um, I think that uh, with that regulation what we're doing is putting Facebook on a position of as a moral entity. And I don't think that companies like Facebook and Google should be put in that moral position. It's the society that has that job, that task, uh, and it shouldn't be a place for neither the regulator nor, uh, nor companies. And uh, if we do think that as a society that this is a moral question that needs some type of regulation, first we would need to have that discussion and on the second instance then this would mean that for many legal cultures within Europe we would need to rethink um, our speech regulation overall and make it more consistent. But um, this sort of collage is um, bringing more side effects, unwanted side effects. No, I don't think that um, that uh, a law should be um, regulating with the approach of regulating a specific technology. Um, or in other words, um, the concept law should be technology neutral. So it should not be about the technology, but about the human uptake of technology and the risks and conflicts uh, implied in that technology being by the use or being by the application and implementation of these types of technology. And for that we already have loads of regulation. There is even um, a lot of bad practices because we've been regulating algorithms since uh, the 1980s. There are international treaties like the Basel Agreement that regulates how um, financial entities should make their algorithms for scoring. And uh, it needed two times a reform. It's still not perfect yet because they are very specific on how um, financial entities should create their algorithms. And that doesn't work out uh, because um, the situation and the context has changed um, and the technologies change, as you say. And uh, of course, um, one of the things that I would encourage is to look at already existing regulation where we might not have the word algorithm in it, but there's the word method in it or statistics and is precisely doing that and uh, rethink of that and take a look at the historical track record of that piece of regulation and look whether there were a lot of uh, protests, how did it help for the sector or not and you will usually see that the way you go come forward with regulation about technology or um, that has been created on the occasion of new technology uh, being commercialized in the market is when you look at the specific harms and conflicts. Overall I would say uh, we're at the very beginnings of using what we call soft artificial uh, intelligence. Uh, I'm not comfortable using the word artificial intelligence because I think it's an anthropomorphization of something that is way simpler than we assume that it is. So what it counts when it comes about, about when, it, when it comes to propaganda, when it comes of dissemination of misinf disinformation, is whether you're able to see and perceive different opinions. And that is what makes the difference between countries like Spain and China. You won't find many diverging opinions, you won't perceive them in China, but you will hear very different opinions. Quite on the contrary, you would see very much polarized societies and you would perceive your society as polarized because you're seeing a lot of other different opinions. So 
as long as we're saying that, um, we're fine. The question is how society um, works with that situation of polarization and what society makes of that situation. But I, um, through that more visibility about other opinions, I would say that this is a confirmation that the filter bubble is not there as we think, uh, but that does not mean that this type of polarization that is made more visible through new media, through social media, that that doesn't have a social impact and that doesn't have a repercussion on society. It does, but this is something still um, where science and where studies need to be done to understand what are going to be the spillover effects of this type of situation that we're having now.